One of the things I think this is the case is, I think people are always looking for an excuse to have their character corrupted. Because if your character is corrupt, then you get to lie, and you get to cheat, and you get to steal, and you get to betray, and you get to act resentfully, and you get to do nothing. And that's all easy. It's easier to lie than to tell the truth. It's easier to do nothing than to do something. So there's always part of you thinking, well, I need a justification for being useless and horrible. That, that'd be a lot less work. And so then if something terrible comes along, you think, aha, that's just exactly the excuse that I was waiting for. And then out all that comes. You know, Solzhenitsyn, when he was in the concentration camps in Russia, watching how people behave, you know, he said that there were people who were put in the camps who immediately became trustees or guards, and they were even more vicious than the people who had been hired as guards. His idea was that they had collected all that, all that foulness around them in normal life. But they didn't have the opportunity to express it. But as soon as you gave them the opportunity, it was like, there it was, right away. So, so one of the messages that seems to echo through these domestic stories is that just because something terrible happens to you doesn't mean that you get to be, that you get to wander off the path and make things work. And maybe it doesn't matter how terrible it is that what happens to you. That's a tough call, you know, because you see people now and then in life who they've really got it rough, man. Like 50 bad things are happening to them at the same time, and you think, well, it's no wonder. If you were bitter and resentful and hostile, it'd be like, yeah, no wonder. But then you meet people at the social distancing again, talking about like elegance. He met lots of people, not lots. He met enough people to impress him in the concentration camp system who didn't allow their misfortunes to corrupt them. That's something. Because maybe the only real misfortune is to become corrupted. That's a really useful thing. You know, maybe the rest of it, maybe the rest of it is trivial in comparison. I know that's a rough thing because you can be in very harsh circumstances, but I do think there's something to do that. And the Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So that's an echo of the idea that we encountered earlier about walking with God, right? So Adam walked with God before he ate the fruit with Eve, and then he wouldn't walk with God. And then Noah walked with God, and Abraham walked with God. And so the idea is, well, that's that alignment with the highest ideal. I think it's something like that. And, you know, we could think about that as a metaphysical claim as well. But I don't think it is. I mean, I've got thousands of letters now in the last year from people who have told me that they were in a pit. That's exactly right. And that they decided that they were going to try to put their lives together and that it worked. And so that's really something, you know, and they write surprised. It's like, well, I decided that I was gonna work hard at what I was doing and I wasn't gonna lie any more than absolutely necessary. Thought I'd give it a try for a few months, you know? And all sorts of good things started to happen to me. It's like, maybe that's how the world works. Now, obviously, it doesn't work like that all the time, right? Because you can get sliced off at the knees. I mean, there's an arbitrary element to existence that's, that you can't wish away. But that doesn't mean that there are... It doesn't mean that there aren't bad strategies and good strategies. And so, I do think that one of the most fundamental existential questions is, like, if things aren't going well for you in your life is, are you absolutely certain that you're doing absolutely everything you can to put things in order? Well, if you need something to grapple with, you probably do. You can find that. You just look inside. You'll find something to grapple with. You know, inadequacy, weakness, susceptibility to temptation, narcissism, pride, envy, revenge, resentment, frustration, lack of faith, all of that. that that'll keep you occupied if you really grapple with it. And yeah, I mean... That's an ancient theological question. You know, what's up with the devil? Why, why, is the, why does the possibility of evil exist? Why is there an eternal adversary? You see that reflected in Cain and Abel, right? At the beginning of the Genesis stories, essentially. The first two human beings are good set against an adversary. And that's, that's what opens history, that story. You think, well, why would God construct such a 
why would God, God construct a reality where an adversary exists? And maybe it's because all things considered, a world with an adversary is a better world, just like a garden with a snake in it is a better garden. These things aren't easy to understand. No, no snake, no necessity to contend with snakes. So why be awake at all? No adversary, no challenge. Why be challenged? Because maybe you're better for the challenge. And maybe that's the challenge, to see if you can be better for the challenge. But that should be internal. Well, fundamentally, well, if it isn't, you'll find it externally because you'll demonize someone to turn them into Satan so that you can find an adversary. And then that's very unfortunate for you and for them. That's and the it's problem. it's just not as big a battle. It's like you, you battle with someone external who's malevolent, let's say, or you think they are, and usually you've got that mostly wrong, but not always. But if the battle is inside, which is where it's supposed to be, but most fundamentally, then, well, then it's the ultimate, it is the ultimate challenge. And that's the infinite game. And the external one Battle isn't. between good and evil on a playing field of chaos and order. It's the eternal game. And, you know, you can play that out in the external world. But part of what the religious enterprise is about, and the Christians have really contributed to this, is the notion that that sacred battle is fundamentally spiritual, which is to say, in some sense, fundamentally psychological. It's to be, it's to be fought on the battleground of the soul, internally. It's a subjective issue. How do you defeat evil? You defeat evil in your own heart. That's, that is how you do it. And so if that's all being acted out for you in the world, well, you, you've misplaced Satan. That's a good way of thinking about it. This is another weakness, I think, of the atheistic position because you can, it's pretty hard, it's an easy in some sense to dispense with belief in the highest good, but it's not so easy to dispense with belief in evil. So that's a big problem. So then where do you localize it? And you can find evidence of it everywhere, certainly in institutions. I mean, that's the whole systemic racism, corrupt patriarchy narrative is that Satan is to be found at the core of our institutions. And to some degree, that's true, because everything you do is corrupt to some degree. And so then do you fight it sociologically? If you're the good person and the, the institution is Satan? But you're so good, are you? You're so sure of that, are you? You've got everything in order, are you? And you might say, well, you have to have everything in order before you fight evil on the sociological front. And, the answer is, well, no, because you're never going to have everything in order, but you still shouldn't put the cart before the horse. It's really, it's a spiritual battle. It's taken people thousands and thousands of years to figure this out. Now, first of all, it was the snake. What's, what's evil? What's malevolent? The predatory reptile. Fair enough, man. I mean, we've been fighting with predatory reptiles for 60 million years as mammals. 60 million years. So it's a good first pass approximation. It's the snake, the poisonous snake, the external enemy, the predator. Well, what about the predator and other people? Oh yeah, that's even worse, man. It's like how pred predators are one thing, but predatory people, other tribes, man, they're brutal, they're brutal. Well, what about your predatory friend? Oh, that's pretty bad too. The friend who stabs you in the back, the person who betrays you, Judas. God, maybe that's the ultimate snake. Well, how about when you betray yourself? Oh, yeah. Do you want to see there's this association that's very strange that occurred in the development of Christian thought between the snake in the Garden of Eden and Satan? There's no indication in the original story that the snake has anything to do with the Lord of all evil. It's a very weird conclusion that's been drawn. It's almost extra biblical because there's almost no mention of Satan in the Bible at all, much less any direct connection between the serpent and Satan. It's a very, very strange idea, but it's part of this psychologization of evil. Like, well, what's the ultimate predator? What's the ultimate predator? What's the enemy you harbor in your own heart who hates you? That's the ultimate predator. There's these images of Mary uh, with her head in the stars and baby in her arms with her foot on a snake. Like, well, that, that's the eternal feminine heads in the stars because she's oriented towards the highest good and she's protecting her infant from predators. That could be 
an actual predator. That's been the case throughout not just human history, but mammalian history. Could be other people who are predators. Could be men who are predators. Could be her who's a predator. The devouring mother. It's like, well, what, what's the ultimate locale of genuine evil? Well, the highest religious answer is, that's in you. That's the proper place to battle it out. And I think that's true. I think that's lit. It's literally and metaphorically true. And I, I was convinced of that in part because of Solzhenitsyn's writings, because Solzhenitsyn identified the totalitarian state with the willingness of the subjects of that state, the subjects and the perpetrators at the same time, to live by lies. No, no, law, no totalitarian state if people don't lie. And every time you lie in support of the totalitarian state, then you're the perpetrator. And that's a psychological issue. It's like, do you lie to get along or not? Say, well, what does it matter? I'll go along with it. Okay. We'll see how it matters. Because it matters. And that's all a psychodrama as far as I'm concerned. But fundamentally, when it's properly placed. You've got plenty of problems to take care of on your own front. And that's where you should concentrate your effort.